Today, my name is Alec Pollard, and I'm going to talk to you about the Upper Mission Canyon members, specifically the Elida and the Frobisher beds, and just kind of showcase how you can utilize sedimentology to figure out what you're looking at and what member of the Mission Canyon formation you are actually looking at. So there is a bit of an issue in trying to distinguish between the two units, the Frobisher, the Elida, or Frobisher Elida. Well, essentially, they are genetically distinct units. So you're either in the Frobisher or you're working within the Elida. And um, there's a lot of questions about, you know, how do you separate the two? And that's why there's all this confusion and some people actually lump them together. So how do we get to this problem? Essentially, the beds were, the, well, the two members were kind of described in the literature and a lot of great work has been was done at this time and these interpretations from the late 50s early 60s have been basically just people run or run away with it there's been no real updates on the con concepts of this time and a lot of people have used textbook models to try to understand what's going on and um, another problem is that there's widespread wells drilled throughout southeastern Saskatchewan, and a lot of people are using petrophysical maps to distinguish between the two beds. And, you know, if it's not known yet, I'm quite happy to tell you that it's extremely complicated to look at petrophysical rocks and carbonates. That's well written in the literature. And uh, carbonate rocks are kind of enigmatic when it comes to the petrophysical signatures. I'm sure most workers already know this. So to distinguish the you know, genetic differences between the Elida and the Frobisher are just not that simple in the logs. And I will display some, some of this later on in the presentation. And um, finally, <laughs> this leads to the Kisby. You know, the people can see sands in their petrophysical logs and they say, right, that's the Kisby. And that's what's separating the Frobisher from the Elida. Unfortunately, it's much more complicated than that. So essentially the problem has kind of evolved, you know, using old models uh, not using their observations, uh, trying to shoehorn textbook con conceptual models into a very complex basin and then, you know, using extensive petrophysical mapping rather than looking at drill cuttings and core. So talking about models, here are some wonderful models from textbooks. Um, done by people that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. These are excellent concepts, but in reality, you know, when you look at the basin, it's not as clear cut. It's not just beach, uh, lagoon, beach barrier bar, shoals, ramp. It's, it's just more complicated than that. And then also there's the issue of the inconformities, the erosional surfaces. Do you actually see lagoons? You know, like these models are not, they're, they're idealized sections. They're not true reflections of what can happen at specific periods of time. Like, are these models developed in the modern that doesn't extrapolate to um, an existence in the Mississippian or the Devonian or the Cambrian? So essentially, you know, the this picture of these models here is a little bit of an icebreaker. This is the, what the camera man wants to show. This is this is like not a real cross section of humanity. This is just some some models. So they're not. It's not based in reality. Not every human is going to be at this height at this weight. And that good looking. You know, it's just life is a little bit more complicated. So just please understand that these models are are not true representations of what's happening in the basin. So if you look at the stratigraphy. This is uh, from the Ministry of Energy and Resources, and my everything is pretty good. Like this is essentially how it stacks up. Unfortunately, that Kisby, I would preferably remove that Kisby because I don't think is there a time equivalent between the Elida and the Frobisher? Of course there is, and it's probably an erosive state. Is there sand sometimes in that between those two units? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that there's a Kisby sand, and I have yet to see evidence of a widespread sand across the entire basin. It's simply not there. So if we want to look at some Elida facies, and I'm just going to do this quick and dirty so we can really spend time looking at the core. The Elida typical, ty typifies to me an intertidal deposit. So essentially, it's mostly interparticle porosity. Uh, the allochems are quite clear to see. So 
there's you know skeletal wax stone and skeletal pack stone. You can get wood green stones and you can get skeletal float stones. So in these three pictures on the left hand side, this is a typical skeletal wax stone of the Elida beds or the Elida member, I should say. And we can see some bivalve fragments kind of scattered around, uh, kind of them stereums of kind of poking around. I'm just going to turn on my pointer so I can point this out to you as we go. Boom. Right. So here we have an looks like an echinoderm fragment to me, like a sterium. And there's some bivalves in there. I'm sure they're ostracods. Maybe this cream colored fragment right here is a crinoid. If you go to the skeletal wax stone, you know, the grains are, I would say, abraded and broken, pretty well reworked um, into particle porosity. And so if I kind of go to this middle one, this is the skeletal pack stone to green stone, and we can see some larger coral fragments. There will be the typical like faunal assemblage for the elida would be Brachiopods, bryozoans, crinoids, so that pelotozoan assemblage, um, and heterozoan assemblage as well. Uh, bryozoans, brachiopods, bivalves, ooids as well. So a lot of like skeletal debris that's, uh, you know, they're, they're more like filter feeders, I would say, essentially. And to the far right, we have a greenstone. And again, it's this, that same faunal assemblage. And the reason why I identified it as intertidal is just because of the reworking. Um, through the tidal currents, you can definitely see abrasion. You can see particles being surrounded, and uh, you can see wood grain stones. You'll see dune formations and so on. Maybe some of my pictures actually have that. Okay, so if we keep cruising along uh, on, for the Elida on this far left, again, a lovely rugous coral, solitary coral. Actually, there's like another one right, right down here. There are, you know, brachiopods, crinoids, bivalves, bryozoans. And that's very typical of the Elida. So if we go across to the next one, nicely oil stained, something interesting is happening through there. Um, that could, looks like, it's like a bedding plate or a folder fracture with some style lights on it. Essentially, I just wanted to show you the skeletal pack stone. Uh, the Elida, this is, you know, it's not every, every geographic area, area will have its kind of um, high, like, small scale subtleties, but essentially you can say that the Elida typifies an interparticle inter porosity. You do get some more like porosity, especially with the coral fragments and buggy porosity too. So right here, this iron oxidized um, rock shot, you can see a little band here and I actually have a picture. Unfortunately, my ugly face is blocking it, but you can, can, you can see these quartz grains, just co co coarse quartz grains. And this comes from this kind of like a band right here. Uh, right, so this pristine quartz is in the Elida, and just underneath this kind of pristine quartz band, there are a bunch of skeletal debris inside there as well. It's all been oxidized, oxidized. Um, kind of interesting in this kind of like rock shot right here that I'm focusing on. The In between the quartz grains, there's calcite cement. So actually when you put acid on it, it effervesces rapidly, but the quartz grains do not, and they're lovely and coarse, they're surrounded to angular. So it's a very interesting feature of the of, um, of the Elida. Fascinating member, actually. To switch gears to the Frobisher, right off the bat, you can see big differences. Um, there's, there's hardly any skeletal debris. You know, let's start with the left and move right. So large coated grains, they're actually pyzoids, calcrete crusts, uh, buggy porosity. There is some fanciful porosity towards the base, but you can kind of see like stacked cycles repeated. So calcrete crust, calcrete crust, calcrete crust, the large pyzoids. Pyzoids always have like um, irregular quartzes. I do have some thin sections we look at afterwards. So if we move across to the second one again, calcrete crust, uh, coated grain, greenstone, redstone. You can see that these coated grains are not uh, of a uniform size, they're mixed, mixed, uh, mixed sizes, and they're scattered around. They're not exactly uh, like a pristine ooid deposit, and this has been known as ooids essentially. Other ooids in the Frobisher, absolutely, but the majority of the alicams actually they're peloid, so it's in this kind of like muddy sediments. Then we get into the coated greens, of which ooids are part of coated, coated greens, as are pyzoids. So these large, you know. <laughs> this is this is one centimeter, and this guy is you know more than half of a centimeter. These are all pyzoids, and I'll show I'll show you some thin sections for for any doubting Thomases or doubting Susans out there. We're moving across a little bit more, here we have uh, looks like a gastropod to me, and it's kind of floating around. So that's 
the first skeletal organism that we've seen, but there are ostracoids floating around that you can't really see. Again, I just want to show that there is kind of like fenestral porosity and buggy porosity, not so much that interparticle porosity typified of the Elida, so it's a completely different system. And we're moving across the last rock, and again, it's the same kind of setup. There are there are there is some skeletal debris. Oh, that's actually what's it. There's um, coated grains, pyzoids, calcite crust, some clasts that are recoded, very much a super tidal deposit. Now let's look at some thin sections. <clears throat> so if we look at this top left here, a typical pedogenic development of a carbonate uh, calcrete horizon has pyzoids in it. And pyzoids are essentially coated grains that are, have irregular coat, like these are the identify, identifiable features. Irregular cortices, green cracking. So here we have some cracks. We can see the irregular cortices around it. And if you look at the nucleus, the nucleus is essentially a bunch of piezo, um, heloids and coated greens. They're getting recoded. So this is a factor of wetting and drying. As the as the grains are getting wet, it creates a gel. <clears throat> the gel comes to life essentially with um, with the interaction with water. And then as it dries, it precipitates calcite. And then during, you know, essentially they can become baked because they're subarily exposed. That's when they crack. And this process just happens over and over and over and over and over through wetting and drying cycles. Um, right, uh, like right 1990, 1992, up to 2005, VP Wright has produced a lot of work as well as Alonso Zarza. And uh, I think um, Esteban and Clapper also have some good papers. They really um, kind of kickstarted this work in the 90s. Uh, if we're kind of moving along, it's all the same things. And I just really want to expose to you what is the difference between coated grains, right? So we have these pyzoids here, and these are all forming in a super tidal environment, meaning that they're being summarily exposed. This picture right here is actually a calcrete crust. So it looks like peloids, but it's super fine. There is no porosity or permeability. So if you have a stacked crust horizon, it essentially acts as a seal. And we have some coated grains at the bottom, peloids at the top. And if we move on to the right, here's a cracked grain, looks a little odd. Uh, there's some um, late stage diagenesis. You can see some blocky calcite cements and some Jersey cements. And essentially, this it fluctuates between muddy peritidal carbonates to supertidal carbonates. This picture down here on the left. Bottom left, you can see the fenestral porosity, which is also typical of the Frobisher beds. Lots of peloids and a couple of coated grains. And then if we jump to this one, this is a great picture. I really like it because there are some very small grains. I don't have a scale on there, unfortunately, but these are less than two millimeter size. These can be characterized as oids, and essentially some of them may very well be oids, but this large grain in the center is not. This is a pyzoid. So we have a very interesting nuclei which resembles the left. And these are from two different wells, so it's not it's not from the same area. But essentially, you have that muddy peritidal sediment that has essentially been ripped. Like, uh, I, would, I don't want to use the word rip up because it's implying high energy, but it essentially has been displaced. And you get these irregular cortices forming around it. And that is a classic profile for a pedogenic development. Going towards the right, more of the same. Here we have a large pyzoid, kind of being in a muddy sediment, uh, has been displaced by gas and airflow. And that's a whole other story. I'm actually presenting all of this, all of these novel ideas uh, for a virtual presentation. So you can take a look at that later on uh, after the vir virtual, virtual. That's a that's a shameless plug, I, I guess. Anyway, so moving along, I just want to put the idea out there that there are two genetic units, and I think you can see it very easily in the core, and you can easily see it in the thin sections and that petrophysical, uh, that petrographic rock that I showed in the Alida, but essentially you don't get to see this difference through petrophysical logs. So here are these logs that I've been talking about. The Geoscout has told me that 1501 through 30 west of 1 is all of the Alida. This is their perf zone. And when I'm looking at it, I'd say, okay, that's all well and good, but potentially if I look at my PE curve, there are some changes. Who, you know, is it is it true? You know, maybe some of these can be interpreted as, as sounds. And just after this presentation, we're gonna look at this core and, and then we'll see if the proof is in the pudding. We jump to 15, 2, 3, 30 west of 1. Juice Bell tells me that we have the Frobisher contact is right underneath the lower waters, and that's fine. 
and then the kiss B is for the do is down here. And you know, everybody that has like fingers that they, they say, yeah, this is this and this is that. I typically do use the logs a lot and I use them to do depth correction. And then I use them to, after I've identified my faces and identified what exactly I'm looking at, whether it's through drill cuttings or core, it doesn't matter. Then I go and I, I play with my logs and I put the truth in there, I guess, essentially. So uh, when I look at this, can some of these responses equate to a sound? Possibly. And we will take a look at that in the core and verify. 12, 24, 5, 33, west of 1. They say there's the Pro Show, the Kisby, then the Elida. And they're looking at this sound response. Uh, they've proved a couple zones. But I think that when I'm looking at this, I do see from the signatures of the Sonic plus the Gamma, I think that essentially there could be a couple more, more sounds than... And which one is the Kisby, right? Like, uh, that's, that's, that's the big game, apparently. 1626, 6-2 west of 2, again, Geoscout tells me that just under the level of truce is the Elider, and I do like this pick for the top of the Mississippi, and I really do, but I'm looking at this, and this doesn't really tell me much, it's a very old log, the lead log is not fantastic, so this is kind of cryptic, is it actually the Elider, the Frobisher? I would rather verify that. And then we have 16 of 10, 6, 1, west of 2. They picked the top of the lower watch roost. <laughs> and then the Mississippian system. So they didn't even, didn't even dare venture to decide what's, what's the difference. And using the tools of sedimentology, that rudimentary scale that I've just described to you, you can basically distinguish between the two formations now. Hi, I'm Alec Pollard, and I'm just going to give you a run through of some of the core that I've described in my presentation. So essentially the issue is, do we delineate the Frobisher from the Elida through the Kisby sand? And I think that this can be problematic and the cores I've laid out will demonstrate that for us. So essentially what we have is we have that intertidal signature from the Elida facies. And if you'd remember from my presentation just a little while ago, I talked about skeletal wax stones and skeletal pack stones, and that's precisely what we're seeing here in these facies. So this is very typical of a lovely Elida reservoir. Typically the skeletal wax stone, as you can see, has a high absorption rate. So when I spray it with my water, it tends to absorb it really quick. That tells us that there's a really nice permeability. But the perme permeability favors water rather than hydrocarbons. Now, as you can see, I have two pins located right here and right here, and that's kind of showing me that this is an area that I'd like to take a closer look at. So I would say when I'm looking down in this area and I see lovely fossils like this, solitary coral, that tells me that you know we have that kind of intertidal facies that we've discussed. It's quite plain and obvious to me that this is that intertidal elida facies skeletal fragments, solitary corals. There's usually a quite a bit of skeletal debris and you can really start to see some bivalves coming out, um, more corals. Uh, you won't really be able to see unless you look in thin section, but you will expect to see crinoids and bryozoans. And you may actually see some crinoids floating around like we do right here. cream to white alicams, like, like hair. These are pelletozoans, so crinoids. Uh, there are some echinoderms as well, but all in all, it's pretty obvious that it's a more of a marine intertidal type facies assemblage. So using this sedimentological tool and understanding what the facies of the elida typically are, I can start to see that there is a bit of a change. And what's interesting in these areas, as we're starting to see some strange hydrocarbon staining focuses at the top, there seems to be some sort of a contact here. I can get, again, I know I'm still in the elider because I can see the fossil debris. I'm seeing more contacts, possibly erosional. And the oil, the hydrocarbons are basically like starting to trap. The skeletal wax stone, which I classify as not a good reservoir for hydrocarbons, but very good for water. Even the skeletal wax stone tends to be stained. That tells me that we're coming up to a point where there's possibly a lateral seal. And I think it has to do with these erosive surfaces. 
quite a bit of hyd hydrocarbon staining in this section right here. And we can see a nice lovely contact and the hydrocarbons are kind of bumped up against it. So I know that I'm in the true elider. I know that there is a lot of erosion and uh, re reworking of sediments in this area. That's how I s what I can see. Now I've used this blue pin to kind of indicate perhaps the top of the elider because I can see that there is a contact and then I go through a transitional zone. So just to give you a little idea of what I mean when I say that. So, I mean, it's not the typical elider facies that we kind of explored lower in the section, but we can see that there's some contacts right through here. We have a nice anhydrite. This kind of reminds me of an erosional surface, so I interpret these anhydrite precipitates as not forming for soil, but definitely occurring when there is a decent amount of exposure through time. Uh, so we have our contact, and then I term this a transitional zone. I don't believe that there's a hard break. And the mineralogy for this transitional zone tends to be dolomitic, some calcite, and some siliciclastics. So essentially, you know, we looked at the log responses. It didn't look like there was anything interesting. There are some bumps, but nothing that would strike the exploring geologist through petrophysical logs that this is definitely the Kisby. So what do I call this? I call this a transitional zone. And the allochems are kind of replaced, and I think that's a process of the dolomitization. Or perhaps there, it's, it's, I just look at this as a transitional erosive deposit. And this looks pretty much the same. You're seeing some ghost fabrics, not really seeing any, any kind of uh, true faunal assemblage that tells me I'm in a certain type of deposition environment. It just looks to me that these sediments have been reworked between the two members. So it's a, it's a period of not exactly non-deposition, but definitely a period of erosion and reworking. Now things start to get a bit more interesting. As we're going up through the section, the rocks start to look a lot different. So that kind of transitional sediment, there is a little bit of hydrocarbon staining. But when we look through this top zone here, we're starting to see vuggy porosity. Mind you, it's all occluded by anhydrite, so not exactly a productive zone. But the vugs are telling me that we're now into a more of a diagenetic environment, meteoric diagenesis. Essentially, this type of development hints that we are now into more of supertidal rather than intertidal deposition. And voila. Instead of seeing intertidal, more marine type sediment, sediments that show uh, reworking and abrasion, what I am actually starting to see are coated grains, rather large, larger than two millimeters. So these aren't ooids. These are not formed in a marine environment through wind and waves or tides. These are actually coated grains. And coated grains that are large like this and poorly sorted are good indicators of forming in a meteoric environment. Now this section here, I have defined from this blue line as being definitely rocks forming in a supertidal environment. And these rocks forming in a supertidal environment are very typical of the Frobisher. So when I start to see large coated grains, vuggy porosity. The next thing I want to see are some of the other facies that we looked at. Calcareous crusts, rootlets, uh, reverse grading. That lovely vuggy porosity. And it's starting to develop as we go further up in the section. So we can see kind of fenestral porosity, reverse graded, some calcare crusts occurring, and then multiple, that multiple stacked horizon that's really classic of a supertidal environment. So therefore, I would say that just because we don't have that petrophysical response showing us a true Kisby, what we do see is we see the Elida transitional zone, Frobisher. And you can't get that level of detail from the petrophysical logs. They will not tell you the facies, but the facies will tell you exactly which member of the Mission Canyon you're looking at. So now that we've established that transitional zone and we've now graded into the Frobisher member, just want to kind of quickly show you 
a bit more of these repetitive typefaces that we can see basically essentially across southeastern Saskatchewan. So when I think about the Frobisher, I think of the supertidal environment, I think of meteoric diagenesis, and I think of basically uh, the development of co coated grains, uh, a lot of subaerial exposure, and this is only proofed by the observations that I see and the assemblage of grains. So when I look and I can see fenestral porosity at the base, you know, these are all occluded by anhydrite, kind of a reverse graded with larger floating grains or coated clasts, bit of a break and then somewhat of a repetition. That, that to me is classic Frobisher and is quite common throughout the Mississippi and we can see these supertidal diagenetic fabrics across North America and Europe and um, they're all forming in these like semi-arid to arid environments. So just to quickly go through the Frobisher and I don't need to go into too much detail, I am presenting a uh, more detailed look at the Frobisher facies in the virtual presentation section. So we'll talk all about it. But I think when I start to see these types of fabrics, fenestral porosity with buggy porosity, larger clasts floating, that tells me that we're definitely in a supertidal environment. And this typifies frobisher fru sedimentation and alteration. And this rock right here, I'm seeing these kind of larger vertical type open zones. I interpret these as rootlets. Um, I don't have any examples, obviously, in core, but in thin section, I start to see alveolar structures, which are very typical of rise accretions. And not only are these apparent here, but they're, what are they surrounded by? What is the assemblage? And the assemblage are supertidal alchems, supertidal particles. So it's not just the evidence of coated grains or pyzoids. It's the evidence of all of them together in a deposit that is genetic to a supertidal environment. Similarly with the elida where all of the alichems are genetic. Oh, yeah, this way. Where all the alichems are genetic to an intertidal environment. And that's basically how you can distinguish between the two members of the Mission Canyon Formation. There's a nice example again. Domain has a crack going through it. But essentially we can still see what I'm referring to. We can see Vuggy porosity, larger floating grains towards the top, a break where we have calcareous crust, large pyzoids floating around in a vuggy, within vuggy porosity, uh, a little bit of a style of light, which could be a lithological break. But essentially, this stacked repetitive cycle is just right on top of each other. I've pointed out a couple of things to we can see the future, these two blue pins. But before we get there, we could just take a look at a bit of a little, uh, bit of a break in the erosional contact. And again, the hydrocarbons have used this as a top seal and also perhaps a lateral seal as things are pin pinching out as we are uh, approaching the erosional uh, unconformity. In this, in this particular area, it's in Township 3. Um, but what I've pointed out in these pins is essentially starting here. And this is dolomitic, high permeability rates. There is some siliciclastic debris in here. Um, and there is calcite as well. So this could be one of those marker beds. And we looked at the logs, and it didn't really pop up in any way, but I did highlight it. And this could also be interpreted as the Kisby. So essentially, that's, this is part of the problem. We have these multiple siliciclastic dolomitic units which is what people identify as the quote-unquote Kisby sand. So which one is the Kisby? None of them. It doesn't matter about where you see the sand deposits. The sand deposits are indicative of a climatic shift on the continent. So we're in a semi-arid environment. There's humidity on the continent. You get a storm. It, obviously, you get storms in the desert, mobilizing the siliciclastics that are being distributed in through the basin wherever there's accommodation. And that's what these siliciclastic dolomitic units are telling you. And just to finish it off, we have this siliciclastic dolomitic input, and then we're right back into Frobisher-style deposition and diagenesis. And of course, just at the top, we have a little bit of karsting infilled with anhydrite. Funnily enough, 
even though it's pretty bad reservoir, because of the anhydride, there's you know lots of porosity and permeability. Um, but it's all been sealed by anhydrite. Still, we found hydrocarbons finding them finding their way in here, which usually is a good indicator that there's probably a good production prospect nearby. So that will be the end of 151330 West of One. All right, so we're moving on to 15 of 2330 West of One, so not too far from the previous well. And again, we have this very similar setup. We looked at the logs. We can see some potentially sandy zones. Uh, the gods of GeoScout didn't really delineate a change. And if they did delineate a change, it's probably not in the correct zone. So this is the proof. This is the pudding. So this is a bit washed out. But it does have that skeletal wax stone appearance, right? Like we can see. Some, some grains, they are some like a uh, little, little bit hard to see in core, might be nicer when, if it was slabbed, but I would classify this as that skeletal wax stone facies. And if we look a little bit lower down, we can see where I sprayed it, it's already dry. So this is the typ typical skeletal wax stone facies that I interpret in the Elida. There's really nothing special going on in these rocks so far. However, we can see some particles in here. We have a little bit of organic material that seems to be, has that wispy type bedding to it. And if we were to take a thin section and look at it, I would expect to see broken skeletal debris. Um, you know, my faunal assemblage that I would expect to see would be possibly some ooids, possibly co coated grains. Um, Palesopods, bivalves, brachiopods, broken up, abraded into this fine kind of c carbonate sand matrix. It's not the prettiest rock in the world, but still, this species is something that I've seen almost across southeast Saskatchewan essentially. And it's always the same kind of same kind of particle assemblage, skeletal wax stone, just screams to me into tidal. I do see some larger grains in here. Maybe if I slabbed it, I would be able to identify a bit more fossils for you. But again, I would see like echinoderm spicules as well. I haven't mentioned those, but those will be in here as well. And just basically skeletal debris from intertidal, intertidal flat. So I've put this green button here because there is some hydrocarbon staining and you can't feel it, but I can. There, it's definitely going from that kind of soft chalky limestone into coarser material. So this would be a, a, a calc, calc carbonate with some siliciclastics. So I put the pin here just to kind of show you that it's starting here. And also there's a bit of hydrocarbon staining. Now there is no true contact between these two lithologies, but what I do know is that the skeletal wax stone has high permeability rates and it favors water. So potentially there's water displacing the hydrocarbons into the zones where there's better porosity, so interparticle porosity. So as I feel this gritty material, it's carbonate, it's siliciclastic, it's probably not gonna give that classic M response that we'd expect to see for the quote unquote Kisby but I can feel the coarseness and it scratches my knife. So I know that there are siliciclastic particles in here and I can identify them under the microscope. And it's essentially we go into that transitional zone that we saw in the previous call. So there's no real log response to show this change, but if you know what you're looking for and you understand the sedimentology, then you can start to say, okay, great. So I know I have the elida. I know that I can, can basically feel and see siliciclastic grains in, mixed amongst carbonate, and it has this transitional look to it, then I know that we have a period of, I wouldn't say non-deposition, but we have a period of erosion and reworking. So I would say that as geologic time has gone, we have the elida beds being deposited, eroded, reworked, and then essentially we're gonna to start to get into the Frobisher bedding. So before I get to this blue pin and classic Frobisher facies, I do wanna show you some interesting features. 
so we can see these riser accretions. I know that they've been interpreted as potentially burrows, but again, I interpret these as riser accretions based on some of the alveolar structures that I've seen and essentially like the faunal assemblage. So imagine that you have the intertidal sediments being deposited, they're being uplifted, they're spending a considerable amount of time in a subaerial sub environment, allowing for plants to colonize. So I put my pin here as my brick and this is where I interpret the Frobisher beds to initiate. So this is where I'm starting, starting to see that classic diagenetic fabrics of the Frobisher. And we can see nicely in the slab core, some pyzoids, potentially clasps, but they have irregular coatings around them. Again, if we look away from them, we have that buggy porosity, we have pyzoids, there's hardly any skeletal debris, like we're not seeing crinoids or ooids or any of those like classic intertidal inter material. It's all the supertidal, diagenetically, early stage diagenesis, altered material. So that's why I place this as the marker of the base of the Frobisher, and this potentially is the top of the elida. It's kind of hard to see because it's not slabbed and not amazing, but the difference in the diagenetic and the genetic units is clear. It's clear that we have intertidal sediments, which is symbolizing the elida, and we have supertidal sediments, which basically is Frobisher-style deposition. So you don't need to rely on logs to try and tell you what's going on. If you know the facies and you understand how they're formed and developed, then that will, should be your tool to tell you which member you're exploring. Okay, so essentially what I want to prove in a rather rapid manner so we can look at the other core is that the Frobisher development is not only established at the blue pin, but the subaerial exposure and the diagenesic, diagenesis associated with that is really intensified. Also, you know, there is hydrocarbon potential, but I want to keep this relatively academic. This is just a tool to show basin workers that the logs are misleading and you can figure out exactly which member you're in with a little bit of homework. So let's pull up this lovely section here. And I say it's lovely because I've spent a lot of time looking at these things and they are actually quite beautiful and I'm sure it's not Stockholm Syndrome. But essentially, nice crust at the base. We have some buggy porosity, but you know, very fine grain peloids. There's some fenestral porosity, a bit of a break. We get larger grains. Do notice that they are not well ordered. There are larger grains among smaller grains. It's somewhat of a coarsening upwards fabric. Then we get the calcareous crust. The process is somewhat repeated. However, not all of the facies are preserved, which is quite normal in uh, the preservation of geologic rock. Uh, and we have these larger, coarser pyzoids overlain by the calcareous crusts. This process is kind of repeated, coarsening upwards, our coarser grains again, another crust horizon, these large pyzoids up here with, um, you know, you'll see irregular cortices, the grain cracking, like all of the true signatures of, of uh, supertidal, subaerial development of carbonate grains. This is just basically a classic example of that textbook example, I would say. And again, this is occurring during the Frobisher time. Like, just because you don't see a large thick sand doesn't mean that this is all a lighter or all a Fro Frobisher. It means that there's a genetic unit and in that genetic unit, you expect to see a certain faunal assemblage. And in the Frobisher case, it's hardly a faunal assemblage. There's hardly any organisms. They are there, but they're a minor constituent. It's all pedogenesis. It's a supertidal carbonate assemblage, essentially. For the hydrocarbon standpoint, this is a very, very lovely looking well. Great hydrocarbon staining. There is There are some zones that have been analyzed, so it's washed, but I can tell you that the production results for this well are quite good. There is great porosity permeability. There's obviously a lovely top seal, and that would be this unit right here. This would be our top seal. There's a nice little erosive surface right here. This feels a bit sandy. It didn't show up in the logs, but again, 
There's some siliciclastic grains mixed in carbonates, and I think this is very much an exposure surface with redevelopment, redeposition. And as we go up, oh, a lovely fracture right here. And uh, this is a true fracture, not an effect of coring, because I can see, maybe you can see them. You can see the calcite cements kind of growing with it, similar to slick and slides. And look at that, there hydro, there's hydrocarbon staining along, along the fractures, showing that there's communication within this reservoir rock. When I say communication, I mean communication between compartments. And again, the depositional style is a classic Frobisher. Some really fantastic examples of large pyzoids among sm smaller grains, the vuggy porosity. Do we see any fenestral porosity? Maybe at the base here. And the fenestral porosity, it's muddy carbonate sediments during deposition, uh, lots of peloids, ostracods would be some of the organisms you could expect to find. And this is, would be the second reservoir. So we can see, again, classic Frobisher deposition. And I think, you know, this well has been identified as mostly a lighter, but when you look at the rock, you recognize that this is actually Frobisher. Again, fantastic staining. Nice crust at the base, vuggy porosity, pyzoids, kind of like a fenestral development. So these vugs are being opened up. A little bit of core missing. Must be a really nice piece of core that somebody decided to keep. Maybe put it on their mantle place, I'm not sure. And this probably is a time correlative unit to that other siliciclastic zone closer to the top. So I noticed that this has a kind of bluish green color and there's quite a bit of anhydrite, so it's probably related to that, but essentially we can still see large pyzoids and crusts, but things start to look a little bit odd towards the top, fenestral porosity, and we start to see a break. Whoops. And in this break is a change in lithology. It looks a little bit argillaceous, doesn't look great, and I believe that this could be, I would, if I was building a cross section, I would tie this argillaceous, green argillaceous zone to the previous well where we had that sand that was high, high absorption, absorption rates. Potentially, that's a marker bed that I would look to see if I can correlate and basically try to build from that and see if these are time correlative. Again, these don't show up great in the logs, but they are there. So is this the K1, the K2, the K3? It doesn't really matter how you, what you call it. What, we're, what this is showing is that the siliciclastic units are representing a continental event and accommodation within the basin. So once these siliciclastics are in the basin, they're getting reworked by wind, tides, and uh, you know waves are basically getting reworked, and their deposition is where there's accommodation, which is always in the channels. So I have my little yellow pin here, which tells me that's the top bit of iron oxidation, and you can see the rest of this core has a lot of iron oxidation, a lot of anhydrite, so after this Frobisher rock was deposited, it then spent quite a bit of time subarily exposed, allowing these sediments to get oxidized. So this was after the deposition and the early stage supertidal diagenesis, then the rocks were exposed, undergoing um, iron oxidation. So what does that mean for hydrocarbons? Stay away from the red rocks if you're exploring because they're, there's no hydrocarbons. There's, they're pretty much wet. They're, not, they're duster wells, essentially. So for an exploration and production standpoint, I would focus, obviously, where there's nice, good, there's beautiful staining. The logs can kind of put, hint a lot of things to you. You know, you look at the ohms and see, you know, what your pr pr uh, production potential is based on, you know, your gamma and your neutron density. but you really need to take a look at your drill cuttings and your core to establish which member you're in and what is your top, bottom, and lateral seal. So we're just jumping across the basin here. We're now landing in 12, 24, 5, 33, west of 1. We've looked at what the gods and Geoscout have dictated to us that the formation should be. And let's take a look at the proof. So kind of start us off here. Some geologists have slabbed this for me, which I'm eternally grateful. And right, right off the bat, I can see a crinoid stem, so the pelletozoans are present. There are some bivalves, 
and this kind of wispy, organic rich, it's still carbonated, reacts with acid, it's been bioturbated. This is very common in the Elida. And this is a skeletal wax stone. I literally just wet it and already the water is absorbed. So this is kind of kind of classic uh, Elida skeletal wax stone. And what I like in expect to see as I kind of work my way up through the core is a fluctuation between the skeletal wax stone, skeletal flow stone to skeletal pack stone. And the better, better reservoir rock, in my opinion, would be the skeletal pack stone. So just to quickly kind of take a look at this guy here. Larger white crinoid fragments, broken and abraded, that wispy sedimentation, organic rich, has a little bit of a reddish color to it. So that tells me that there's a bit of iron oxidation. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And just to kind of run through this core, as we go further up, you can see that there's some vuggy porosity, more moldic, I would say, but it, this is late stage diagenesis. And if you want to do another comparison between the intertidal Elida versus the supertidal Frobisher, the Elida tends to have interparticle porosity, and the Frobisher tends to have more fenestral, vuggy, and moldic porosity. Not, so it's not just the faunal assemblage, it's the, the, the diagenetic types. And the vugs are not actually formed at the same, like, you know, Frobisher's contemporaneous vug development. This is later stage diagenetic effects. So, you know, skeletal wax stone, what am I expecting to see in here? What do I, what I do see if we looked at this fl slab section? Looks like a bit of a clast, and there's been some compaction in and around it. But if you look at the clast itself, we can see a bivalve with a little, not exactly shelter porosity, but I would say moldic porosity. There are some crinoids in there. Um, yeah, it's probably some ostracods too. So skeletal pack stone with surrounded by a skeletal wax stone, possibly a clast. So we just continue to move forward. There's a bit more iron oxidation. And every time I see increasing iron oxidation, I'm now starting to train my eye to see if I can find an erosional or exposure contact. And the good thing about these contacts is they tend to operate as really good seals. So for hydro hydrocarbon trapping. So you can tell we're getting close to these purple pins and that's the main main focus for this bottom section. And essentially, like we're still in the Elida, we're still in this interparticle, porosity, um, intertidal deposition. And you know, this is skeletal pack stone and all the skeletal alicams are broken and abraded. So that's telling me that there's transportation in the tidal, tidal regime. And yeah, so what do I expect to find? Ooids, crinoids, uh, bryozoans, branching, and fenestral, uh, mechanoderm spicules, like, so that's basically the faunal assemblage and it really bears out under magnification and infant section. So now it's party time because I put these purple pins down and I have to thank my friend Jason Hoden for getting these pins for me. They really pop out and allow me to work on my core a lot easier than those tiny little pins. Anyway, what I can feel here is a very coarse, coarse feel. So you can't feel that, but I can, almost like sandpaper. And when I look at it under a microscope, what do I see? I see some carbonate skeletal grains, so crinoids, bivalves, bryozoans, um, brachiopods. And you can see some, some of that skeletal debris in here, but you also see quartz grains. So fine quartz, um, sub-rounded mixed in with these skeletal debris and it's all bound together by calcite cement. So does this really show up in our log responses? Do we see like that big M kick that tells us that there's sand? Not always, but you will see a response, but it kind of gets lost with all of the data that the petrophysical log is trying to show you. So essentially the best way to find these is looking at the core, looking at your drill cuttings. That's what really kind of trains your eye in. And we can see that there's good hydrocarbon staining in here. There's good porosity, interparticle porosity, good permeability, larger pore throats, favoring the hydrocarbons. 
And I've put this, these pins here as I look through this core. I could see that the grains of quartz essentially terminate at this edge. We're missing some core, so I can't actually see where that contact is. And it's just missed, missed uh, the core is probably missing when they were doing their core analysis. And we're getting back into a lighter skeletal wax stone, skeletal pack stone. This has also been under core analysis, number 33. And we can see a large rugous coral, solitary coral with moldic porosity. Um, it's already been analyzed, so I think that's why we're seeing that kind of dead oil trapped in there. But it's telling you that it's sitting in a potentially productive zone. Um, large floating corals, very common thing to see in the elida in a skeletal pack stone, skeletal kind of float stone regime. Lovely pelotozoids, we can see the crinoids, oil staining again, this has been analyzed. So we're not going to see clean features. But the quartz essentially has been shut off. There's no more siliciclastics. We're now into pretty much pristine carbonate. So as we kind of moving further up this, this well, we're going to fluctuate between the interlida, the elida, um, skeletal pack stone, skeletal wax stone, potentially grain stone, float stone. So I'm not going to really spend too much time describing the facies in detail. I just want to jump up to where the interesting features are to kind of like, you know, we need to discuss what's the Kisby, is it real? And you can probably tell that I don't really believe that the Kisby is a time equivalent bl blanketed sand. I just don't see it in the core. I don't see it as a true formation. I think that all we're seeing are responses to a climatic shift on the continent. So lovely, you know, light is probably my favorite formation to look at. It's highly productive if you know what you're looking at, but there's quite a bit of fossils and uh, lots of corals. There are going to be ooids in here. I can see crinoids. And it's just, uh, I don't know, it's a fascinating piece of rock. And essentially, the elida is interesting because the t they're all somewhat related. That's why it's a formation. But each member is a distinctive depositional diagenetic environment. The Frobisher supertidal, elida is intertidal. Maybe next year, I'll talk about the Tilston. So just stack in that elida, it's nice thick carbonates, lovely reservoir rock as well. We can see the staining starting to come in. Uh, this is a skeletal wax stone, but still there's good staining. That means we're approaching some kind of a seal or something is uh, basically compartmentalizing the reservoir and the poorer reservoir rock is still yielding hydrocarbons. So that's usually a good sign. These rocks have kind of a pinkish color. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, there's a, there's a fracture in the rock. And within the fracture, you can see that iron oxidation. So that's telling me that, you know, a lighter has been deposited. There's a period of non-deposition or erosion. And it's just this, this lithological unit's just sitting there. And it's starting to be oxidized, associated with subaerial exposure. And I would say this is probably our contact, the top of that erosional cycle, because it's red up until it gets there. There's a funny little contact looking there that's really dark and brown. And right underneath it's, it's red. This is the worst reservoir rock. Here we go. That's that kind of palm-sized anhydritic. It's actually a precipitate of anhydrite, calcite, and quartzite. And this typically happens when, you know, just below the surface of subaerial exposed rock. It could be siliciclastic or carbonate or mixed. Anyway, um, I would say that this is probably our erosional contact and a new elida bed depositional sequence begins. So we know because of these large pins that I really want to talk about something. And I really want to talk about the fact that there's sand in here again. So is this the K1, the K2, the K3, the K1000? Again, it doesn't matter to me what you want to call it. I call this a continental event that's being preserved in the rock record. This is not something that I can correlate across the basin. This is not something, this is all the elida, so this can't be the K3. It can't be the K2. It's just an input of sand. And it's quite common across any formation at any age in the Miocene or Pliocene or Pleistocene to have a carbonate clastic unit. And that's essentially what we're seeing. So you can't feel it, but I can. It's nice and coarse. There's a mixture of, you can actually see the skeletal grains in here quite easily. I mean, I can't identify them really well, but you can see that there, are, there is some skeletal Here's a lovely coral. So we have solitary corals. We have 
skeletal debris mixed with sand, and it's all bound again together by calcite cement. So it's just basically you know a channel that's preserving all of these alakems and the calcite cement, cementing it together. But there is still a clastic. This is a clastic carbonate mixed deposit. So I put this pin here because essentially the the um, you know, I can see the same as probably, you know, just the quartz, quartz grains in here. I think it just kind of grades out. So after this pin, I didn't really observe it in the core anymore. I didn't see it under, under microscope. So that's why I've chosen this hard ground there. Maybe there's a contact. I'm not too sure. Oh yeah, there's a little bit of a contact right here. So we can see, I don't know, is that a contact? Yeah, it looks like it to me. Essentially right above this, there is a large decrease in silica input in this unit. Again, classic elida, really fossiliferous actually. Look at that. We got our solitary corals, moldic porosity. There is some staining again. It's been analyzed, so we've lost we've lost some of that true original um, hydrocarbon staining. But essentially, it's you know this is a skeletal rudstone, greenstone. So we're missing a bit of core, which is great. Shorter presentation. We're all happy for that. And we're still in the elida. A couple of cool things to look at are these contacts. There, are, there is this kind of greenish, um, wispy, bioturbated uh, sediments. Could be glauconite, could be chlorite. Have to really do a mineral assessment and kind of deep dive into that to figure it out. It's not too important for today. Uh, what's, what is important though is that we are in this kind of iron oxidized zone. And so I can expect to see some evidence of a contact somewhere around. And as I go up, here we go. Really dark red rock. Oh, a coral fragment. Yeah, there's a floating, oh, there's, a, there's a two? Yeah, there's another one. So yeah, there's some coral fragments in here. So a lighter, skeletal wax stone, but you know, it's been really altered uh, through, through subaerial exposure and probably some reworking because right on top, yeah, we have this thick sand. It's up to 10 feet thick. And yeah, it's really good hydrocarbon staining. There has been some analysis done on this core, so we're not seeing that true staining preserved. But here we go, nice thick sand sitting above some weathered rocks. So we know that this has been exposed, um, some erosion, and then some scouring. So this is like erosional lag of, of a siliciclastic unit. And then we're back into some carbs, but it's been karstified. So this karst, and we can see some of this red, kind of looks like the lower waters. Maybe there's some lower water true sands that are infilling this area, but we've seen these, these large brecciated clasts. So I think now we're into, so we have a siliciclastic contact with carbonate, and then it's been karstified. So we really, you know, there's not, I can't really do a facies idea of this to tell you if this is, I mean, if I analyze each class, perhaps I can identify if it was the Frobisher or not, but the karstification has kind of run through this. So essentially we're just preserving this sand at the top. All right, so. Next up is 162662 west of two. So we're moving on to a new area. And in this area, what do we have kind of at the bottom there? We looked at the logs, didn't really show any like major sand and you know, my famous, world famous pins are here. So at the bottom, a lighter, skeletal pack stone. You've seen the faunal assemblage. You've heard me talk about it. You're probably sick of hearing it, but it's intertidal, uh, reworked, uh, broken or braided, showing transportation. There's bivalves, pelotozoans, so that's the crinoids, um, bryozoans, oowids, some coated grains, canadum fragments. That's what we're looking at. So the lovely skeletal pack stone. And then I have my pins there because again, you can't see it, but I can feel it and I can see it under the microscope. There is skeletal debris, oh, lost it, skeletal debris bound by calcite cement with quartz grains. So essentially we another mixed deposit. Shows a little bump on, on the logs like we talked about, but it's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly a pristine sand and it's certainly not some sand that's blanketing the entire basin. That's not what we're seeing. It's not borne out in the core and it's not borne out uh, like some time equivalent sand across the basin. I can't reiterate that enough. That is not what we see in the rock record. And then right above this mixed carbonate, so it's a clastic deposit, my pin fell out, but it was somewhere around here. 
But now we're back into Elida. And the faces will fluctuate between pack stone and wax stone, float stone, sometimes you get a green stone, essentially just showing a change in energy. And, um, you know, essentially this kind of tidal shoal, tidal sand body, tidal channel, mixed deposits across the Elida. So again, intertidal signature, it's born out in the faunal assemblage, it's born out in the di diagenetic imprint. Again, it's mostly interparticle porosity. There is some moldic porosity in the Elida, but it's developed usually in later stage diagenesis. Ooh, that's cool. We'll talk about that. So here we go. Skeletal pack stone, potentially skeletal grain stone, doesn't really matter. At this level, here we have the pelletozoa and some crinoids. Looks like an echinoid sterium. Uh, skeletal, looks like a bivalve, kind of like a thin bivalve there. More valves, oh, that could be a brachiopod. Looks kind of like it has ridges, or maybe it's broken. Anyway, so again, intertidal deposit. I'm certain that there'll be bryozoans in here, maybe fenestral and branching bryozoans, but lovely skeletal pack stone, skeletal green stone. And what was just caught my eye after I gave it some some water where it was a coral fragment. You can kind of see the colonial coral hair. Is it on the other side? Uh, just little hints of it. Just a little little hint. So lovely coral fragment just kind of sitting there. Oh, again the elida kind of wispy. Looks like it's bioturbated, organic rich. It's carbonate. Uh, you can see this quite commonly throughout the elida. And if we just keep running up through it, it's essentially all elida. Nice little lens of skeletal pack stone, green stone, darker color, kind of concentrating the staining, decent staining towards the top. Again, that kind of wispy deposition. Uh, a little bit more on hydride as we get to the top. So uh, I assume, uh, you know, the logs will show us. I just can't remember right now, but the water is probably just right above, maybe a box or two away. And that is the joy of 1626 of two. Lastly, and certainly not least, we're right next door at 1610 one west of two. And what do we have here? The gods of Geoscout, I think just call it top of the Mississippian section. So we have to do all the work here. And luckily for us, we know our sedimentology, we know what faces we expect to see and what member. And quick question, guys. When you see large coated grains, looks like, like pyzoids, we can kind of see these, these rootlets, very low faunal diversity. We're not seeing that intertidal package of crinoids, bryozoans, bivalves. Um, echinoids, ooids. We're just seeing large coated grains, pyzoids, with some fenestral porosity. What what member of the Mission Canyon Formation has that? Yes, you're right, the Frobisher. So, good sleuths that you are, that we are, I guess. <laughs> we uh, we can easily look at the core. We can look at our drill cuttings. We're looking for the faunal assemblage. Do we have a lot of skeletal debris? Do we have no skeletal debris? These are very simple but important questions that can essentially tell you where you are in the subsurface, what member of the formation you're looking at. Really critical, but simple, simple tools that you can apply. So again, we have the rise accretions. We have coated grains. We have that vuggy porosity, extensive vuggy porosity. So Using the skill set available to us, we can determine that this Mississippian assemblage is actually the Frobisher beds, the, the Frobisher member of the Mission Canyon Formation. And just to cap it off, we have the lower Watrous. Interestingly, with the lower Watrous here, we can see the contact. You can see the Frobisher, and then we can see kind of convoluted bedding and then the Watrous. It's green because it's been reduced, whereas right above it's red because it's been oxidized. And there's, that's a whole other presentation, a whole other story of why we have a reduced environment, well, a re reduced record versus an oxidized record above. It has to do basically with uh, the chemistry, um, fluid chemistry, I guess you could say. And that is the end of my core presentation. I guess in summation, 
because you see a kick on your petrophysical logs, that lovely classic M kick with the right ohms or your density neutron porosity is showing you, yeah, you know, this is the, this is the sand and this is the Kisby, you're probably incorrect because as these cores across several areas of the basin do show, there is no time equivalent sand. They're just multiple inputs of sand and they're showing you a climatic event on the continent, mobilizing these sands and introducing it to the basin where it's being reworked wherever there's accommodation, AKA channels. Thank you very much. All right, well, I guess that conclusion from the uh, core display was a little bit premature, but I'm back. <laughs> and, and I just wanted to, now we've looked at the core, we can look at the logs and essentially have done the homework for us. And I put this, the, this bar right here is a sand input. Doesn't mean that it's a KISB or a K1 or a K whatever. I, I think that that is not exactly accurate. I think it's better if we just understand that within the Alina, there is a sand member with, within, sorry, the Frobisher member, there, there is a sand member and there's a transitional zone between the Alina and the Frobisher, and that may be siliciclastic, or it could be a carbonate siliciclastic mix, or it could just not be there at all. It could just be an erosional front. So this blue bar right here is essentially that transitional zone with some sand in it. And if we look at the logs, there's a tiny little bump here, and there's a little bit of a something there, but the P curve is just showing you, just showing you that there is a change. And I don't think that anybody who uses petrophysical responses will be able to make this pick. But we now can because we understand the differences between the two beds and their two genetically distinct units and utilizing sedimentology and understanding faces, understanding depositional environments and diagenetic environments plus porosity. Like you can really start to tell the difference between the two, two members. So moving on to 12, 121, 15 of two, three west of two. So Geoscout has picked the Frobisher up here and the Kisby down there. Well, I've shown in the core that actually the Elida top is right here. There is a little bit of a bump. There is a little bit of something there to show that potentially there is a sand. But again, this is what the rock is showing. I'm not using remote sensing to come to my conclusions. I'm using the bare evidence in the rock to distinguish between the two members because they are different. So again, Frobisher is actually on top and the lighter exists down here. So this is almost right, but not quite correct. And then 12, 24, 5, 33, west of one. This is wild because these are the three different sands that I identified in the core. And essentially none of this is the Frobisher. It's all of the lighter and the lighter, the sand is essentially all the way up to the top of the core. So again, the petrophysical responses are enigmatic. I don't think that they're truly reliable to do extensive mapping. And could you imagine once you're getting into the production phase or even the royalty phase, you really need to be certain what zone you're in because it makes a difference. You're either creating a good oil well or you're creating a good water well or you're creating a very wet well. And simple, I, would, I don't use the word simple, but basically if you use the principles of sedimentology and look at your core and your drill cuttings, it will tell you which member you're in. And it's essentially that it's, it's I don't want to say it's simple, but that is essentially what you need to do if you want to fully understand the area that you're working in. And this is correct. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you know, that's not bad. We got, Joe Scott was right. 16 of 26, 62 west of two. It is the elider right, right all the way to the top. And I verified that utilizing the core. All right, so 16, 10, six, one west of two. Juice code has indicated to me that is the top of the Mississippi, Mississippian system. And Juice code, you're right again. But I looked at the core, I've done my sedimentology and I know that it's actually the Frobisher. We're at the top of the Frobisher. So just to do my second conclusion and round it up, I picked this picture because it's essentially showing rain on a desert. Yes, you get the, in the desert, it rains too. I've been to the Sahara Desert in Morocco, in Dakhla. It's actually the Western Saharan province. And I got, I arrived there, it rained during the day and there were floods everywhere. There was a mass amount of sediment mobilized from the continent, introduced into a sheltered basin 
where the psilocyclastics clastics were then reworked. I was out in the desert doing field work for three weeks, and when I got back, the water was pristine blue again, and the sand had been reworked throughout the tidal channels. So use that modern analog and think about how those sands are formed in the Mississippian. It doesn't just, I think what we're really seeing is we're seeing a climatic shift or climatic uh, pulse or response in the continent. It's mobilizing the sand and essentially focusing it and it's being transported into the basin where it's getting reworked by winds, tides, currents and, until it becomes part of the rock record. Anyway, thanks again, everyone, and I hope you enjoy my talk. And I can't wait to present in a crowded room or an empty room and field questions live. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. A couple final uh, thank you to Vermilion Energy and Ibu Resources, and also the good folks at the Ministry of Energy and Resources Subsurface Lab. That would be Richard Wood, Kelly Levadier, Ryland, and Dean. Paul Thompson as well. Just uh, thank you for everything, guys. Uh, it's great that you offer this service to the public and researchers in the subsurface. And this picture just basically is a tidal flat in Dakhla, like I mentioned previously in the presentation. And this is staring basin wood. And you can see the plants colonizing a sand body. Okay, have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.